Okay, today I'm going to do something a little different. I'm doing a little webcam capturing while I'm giving my lecture, which is a little bit different than what I'm doing, and I'm hoping I can get out more lectures this way more quickly. Now, as you can tell, I'm at my home office, so you might hear some stray dogs in the background, stray kids in the background, and whatever they're listening to on the TV, so we'll just have to roll with it. But today, let's talk about lepidosaurs. And lepido means scaled, and sour means, of course, lizard. And lepidosaurs are a pretty amazing group, and they include snakes and lizards and this really cool animal off of New Zealand called the tuatara. It's a rhynchocephala that had its heyday back in the Mesozoic. This just goes to show a seropsid phylogeny. Remember, all reptiles are seropsida, which also include the dinosaurs and birds as well. As you can tell, the lepidosaurs are a sister group to the archosaurs. Okay, and like I said, the lepidosaurs include the snakes and the lizards as squamates and this really cool thing, the tuatara, as a rhynchocephala. So what makes lepidosaurs unique? Well, first of all, they have scales, and these scales are keratinized structures of the epidermis. And if you've ever seen a snake shed, they often shed their skin all at once, including all their scales. And then lizards are a little bit more patchy. And what we're showing here is a scoloporus on the left. This is from southwestern New Mexico. And actually, it's this little dewlap out. It's kind of cool how you can see that. And then, of course, on the right side is a gecko. And that gecko was from Africa. And interestingly, I, I snapped this photo. I couldn't believe I got it. But geckos don't have eyelids. What they have is a hard covering over their eye. And they use their tongue to go out and clean, like, basically the window into their eye. Another characteristic of uh, lepidosaurs are, of course, they have internal reproduction like all other amniotes. But lizards have something a little bit different. They have what is called a hemipene. And you can see on the, on the lizard here on your right, it's got a little fork on the penis. And that way, the male can mount the female on either side of her tail. Another thing is that an ancestral condition of the lepidosaurs is that, at least ancestrally, they could lose their tails. And they actually have these fracture plates where lizards can lose their tails. And this is another scoloporus from southwestern New Mexico. And you can see that it's clearly lost its tail. And they can grow it back about one time. And then other squamates kind of lost the ability to lose their tail like snakes. So let's talk about this first clade of lepidosaurs. Like I said, there's two major clades. We got the squamates and we got the rhynchocephala. And the rhynchocephala are an ancient lineage going back over 240 million years. And today, they are only represented by one species, the tuatara. And this is the tuatara. Uh, like I said, these things superficially resemble lizards, but as an early amniote, most things look like modern-day lizards on the outside, but they have some really cool things about them that are different. First of all, one of the reasons why uh, these guys are different is, well, they... Let me show you. Look at that jawbone. Okay, you see the double row? Unlike you and I, we're thecodonts, which is what a lot of archosaurs are. The teeth are set into the socket, or the teeth are actually set into the skin. But these guys, look at that upper jaw. There's two rows of teeth. They're used for grinding and chewing. So mammals are basically the only thing that masticate, except for some of these rhynchocephala. They also live a long time compared to lizards. They live 10 to 20 years, and that's the time it takes to reach maturity. And they also have a third eye. Now, they're not the only pitosaur to have a third eye. But this one comes with a complete retina and a lens. Now, it doesn't really form an image after they grow very old, but what it can do is it is very good at detecting light. So they can use that to judge the time of day. One of the interesting things about the tuatara is that they're found around New Zealand and some islands off of New Zealand. And that's really important because New Zealand is a continental fragment that's been floating out in the ocean for 100 million years or so, a very long time. And as a result, it's been very isolated from the rest of the world. And that isolation is one of the reasons why these two Ataras have managed to survive for 65 and a half million years after the rest of the dinosaurs went extinct. Unfortunately, in modern times, they become highly threatened to habitat loss and they're threatened to extinction from invasive rats. These islands never had rats. And in fact, New Zealand, the only mammal that ever made it there were bats because they could fly. But with humans everywhere, we've brought our rats and our cats and our dogs and our goats and our pigs. And the rats basically are omnivores. They'll eat the eggs and they'll eat the babies as well, as long with anything else they can basically eat. 
And as a result, they've uh, they've caused some real population problems for the Tuataras. Let's talk about the Squamates. Now, this is the other major lineage. They have been around since the very early part of the Jurassic. I mean, the Jurassic began around 200 or so million years ago at the end of a, of a mass extinction. Is a mass? Well, it's a, a pretty good extinction event that ended the Triassic, wiped out a lot of the early dinosaurs. But very quickly, we start to see the very first squamates. And the, and the first squamates were things like geckos and skinks. So those are the most basal ones. And then, and then later on in the Cretaceous, we start to see the iguanids and varanids as well. And snakes basically evolved from lizards, especially the varanids. And uh, so there are varanids that are more closely related to snakes than they are to other lizards. And what that means is lizards are really a paraphyletic group because you have to include the snakes. And we see this all the time in reptiles, right? Birds are monophyletic, snakes are monophyletic, but reptiles, oh boy, you better include those birds. Or if you're a squamate and you're a lizard, you have to actually include the snakes as well. One of the interesting things about squamates, they're the only group that has viviparity, they're oviviparous, and they're oviparous as well. And like many other vertebrates, they can also reproduce at times through parthenogenesis. Uh, mammals, I think, are the only group that has not been observed reproducing by parthenogenesis. And for those of us that live here in New Mexico, we have the New Mexico whiptail. This is Aspidocellus neomexicanus. And this is the New Mexico whiptail. And some of their populations are all female and they reproduce by parthenogenesis. Basically what happens is they go through meiosis one and two. If you remember in meiosis, you split the sister chromatids in meiosis two and you form haploid gametes at that point. And those haploid gametes can fuse together and form a diploid zygote. That's how parthenogenesis works. This is a Echinosaurus panamensis. I saw this in Panama. And this particular family of lizards, the gymnothalidae, they are all oviparous, which means they all lay eggs. And then there are things like rattlesnakes that are viviparous and they, uh, lay, they have live young. So whenever you go to one of those trinket stores, right? And they're like rattlesnake eggs and you open up and it jumps out at you and you say, oh, oh rattlesnakes don't lay eggs. They're viviparous. And then other groups of squamates like this family Lacertidae. Now we don't have these here in New Mexico or, or in the Western Hemisphere for that matter. They're, they're old world. They're found throughout Africa and Europe, but they reproduce by parthenogenesis. Some groups are also viviparous, which means they give live birth and others are oviparous meaning they lay their eggs. Now, of course, squamates include snakes. Now, snakes are feared worldwide by so many people, and with good reason, too. That's because one in six snake species are basically venomous at some level, and some of these snakes are incredibly venomous. And uh, there's two major families of snakes that are venomous. One is the viperidae, rep uh, represented here by Bothrops asper, and it's actually on the right. I took that photo in... Uh, Costa Rica, and it was eating one of those Smellisca frogs. Yeah, pretty crazy. I was pretty excited to get that picture. And on the left is the Acanthopus prolongus from, um, they're originally from Australia, and they're an Elopid, and the Elopidae being the other major family of venomous snakes. They include coral snakes and cobras, but, and these adders as well. And this was behind a glass cage. I didn't take this one out in, in the wild. But the Bothrops asper was a wild picture. So here's a brief overview of our squamates. You know, there are like 10,000 species of lizards. And in fact, people at the University of New Mexico, including Steve Poe's lab, are continually describing new species, especially of anolis lizards. And squamates are monophyletic as well. So the smallest squamate is this little dwarf gecko. And you can find these things in the Dominican Republic and the Virgin Islands and Puerto Rico. But uh, this is the smallest one. This thing is about... Well, there's a dime. You get the idea. That's an adult right there. Now, we always like to know the largest ones, too. So, of course, the largest lizard is the Komodo dragon. These are varanids, and these Komodo dragons grow up to 10 feet long and up to 350 pounds. But they are not the longest of, of the squamates. The longest ones are these pythons, and when you look up snake records, they're all over the place, right? Oh, I saw a snake 30 feet long. I saw a rattlesnake, you know, 10 feet long. Yeah, right. However, um, a lot of them 
do get up to over 12, 15 feet long. Some of the records are clearly at 17 feet long. And I think this uh, reticulated python, 22 feet long and about 130 pounds. And of course, anacondas can get up to that long and weigh about twice as much. So when it comes to the snakes, anacondas are thick. Now, they pale in comparison to one group of uh, marine reptiles called the mosasaurs. And if you saw the last... What was it, the last Jurassic World movie with Chris Pratt and this giant thing jumped up and snagged the great white? That was a mosasaur. They're actually a squamate. They're related to the varanids. The largest ones were over 55 feet or 56 feet long. So they dwarfed any reptile alive today, including, I mean, any reptile today. Now, of course, they weren't as big as some of the land dinosaurs. But these were the dominant marine predators, and they, they ruled the oceans from 101 million years ago right up until the time the dinosaurs went extinct 65 and a half million years ago. And some interesting things about these mosasaurs, they gave live birth. Because remember, amniotes cannot lay eggs in water. They don't have a larval stage, so they can't lay eggs in water. They, they either have to return to land and lay an egg on land like the sea turtles do, or like these guys, they were viviparous. And some recent research indicates that these guys were endothermic, meaning they were warm-blooded. That allowed them to be very active marine predators. Quite terrifying. Okay, so my le- my next lecture is going to cover squamate diversity. And like I said, this slide has about 9,000 species. I've seen a range between eight and 10,000 species. Like I said, we're constantly describing new species all the time. So stay tuned for my next video lecture where I'll discuss more about the diversity of squamates. All right, till then, stay safe.